Um, tonight we're going to talk about what is the judgment of God. Um, currently, we are in the midst of this, um, what they call a COVID-19. If you're watching this video, um, this is when it's being recorded is, is during the period of the time of a of the coronavirus and a number of people have insinuated that this this plague this coronavirus is the judgment of God and um, and usually what they mean by the judgment of God is that God personally by his divine omnipotent power sent this sickness and disease to um, test, to kill, um, to punish, praise God. Amen. And um, there, and with those ideas about God's judgment, of course, the question that's come to me, is that true? Does God judge in that manner? And um, tonight, we want to talk about the judgment of God. Now, there, again, there's two extremes on this teaching or on this view. There are some who, who will tell you that um, because of Jesus and because of the fact that Jesus took upon himself all of our judgment, there is no more judgment. I'm afraid that that is um, a little bit too simplistic, but not biblical, praise God, because there is still judging there's still a judgment, especially for those who reject um, Jesus as their Lord and Savior. There still comes a time of a judgment, and there's still judgments that come on people even to this day. However, we want to see from this that you can be protected from any so-called judgment, and you can also ensure that um, that none of these things come upon you, praise God. But we also, but the main thing here, especially on the basis of this particular ministry, is that we try to show you that God is not in any way, shape, or form behind anything that is evil, sickness, disease, tragedy, anything that some people might call a judgment um, that has nothing to do with God's direct hand upon it. Praise God. So on that note, um, let's get right into our study. We're going, from, we're going to show you a number of scriptures that talk about the judgment of God and show you that that is not what um, people try to make it out to be. And people try to make it out to be a certain way because they simply don't study the Bible, praise God, or they don't study it in its entirety. And people often look at the Bible from a particular lens by which God is the actual um, propagator of destructive behavior. Praise God. Amen. But um, we'll start off with a quote by um, an excellent author, Joe Blair, Baptist minister, in his book called When Bad Things Happen, God Still Loves. And he says, It is possible to come away from a reading of the Old and New Testaments with the image of an angry, wrathful God who is out to get revenge against humanity for its sins. But that depends on how we interpret as we read. God does not create destructive judgment. He simply allows people the judgment they have made for themselves. Um, I believe that Brother Blair's statement is fully biblical and scriptural, and we're going to show you that tonight in this study. Praise God. And uh, first, we'll start off by talking about what is judge? What is the judgment of God? What is the judgment of God? See, if you are, if you and I have been in church for any amount of time, anywhere from a month to a couple of years, we have probably heard that word or that phrase, God's judgment or the judgment of God, once or twice. Praise God, and. Almost every single time we hear the phrase judgment of God or God judgment, it is 99 times out of 100 used in a negative connotation. Hallelujah. Um, and that, again, is because we don't really study the Bible and we don't really study fully um, certain subjects. And the judgment, if you really study the Bible about God's judgment or the judgment of God, it's, not, it's 
far from being all negative, praise God. Now, tonight we are going to focus on the negative aspect because that's the thing that people keep focusing on. So we got to deal with it. But hopefully one day we'll get into a study of God's judgment from a positive aspect. Um, now, a judgment is a decision, praise God. That's basically what it is. It's, it's a decision. You and I do you and I do this all the time. We we make what we call judgments every single day. I mean, um you let's just say that a good example might be you're driving and you're almost at the light. The light is green, but it's just it, it becomes it's starting to turn yellow and you're almost there and now you got to make a judgment. <laughs> Should I go through and take a chance? And the light turns red as soon as I cross the line. And then that camera that's in Providence takes a picture of my car and I get a ticket two weeks later. Or should I stop? You are now making a judgment call. Praise God. That's all God does. God assesses and evaluates a situation. And then he makes a, a judgment or a decision on how he's going to deal with that situation. Praise God. Amen. I making sure that these things, these slides change. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 15, it says, The Lord therefore be judge and judge between me and thee, and see and plead my cause, and deliver me out of thy hand. This is um David talking to Saul. Now he said he says that the let the Lord judge between me and thee. Now, another um, translation of that, the New International Version, says, May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. Praise God. Amen. So that helps us to understand what does it mean by what David is saying that the Lord judge between me and thee. He wants God to make a judgment and make a decision between who's right and who's wrong in this situation. And may he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. Praise God. Amen. Amen. So a judgment is simply a decision. It is not something spooky. It's not something. Woo. It's just simply God's making a decision like you and I make them. In Isaiah 11 verse 4, again from the NIV, it says, but the righteousness, but the righteous, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. Praise God. Amen. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. And so God, his judgment is simply making a decision on something. Hallelujah. So that's all we're trying to do from that one is to understand what does it mean for God to judge. Now. Um, let's talk about how God executes his judgment or how his how his how he executes his judgment shows you exactly what type of God he is. What can, what is his character? Is he a killer? Is he a monster? Is every judgment of God something that we must be afraid of? Uh, um, do, are we expecting God every time we hear the word God's judgment? Um, are we expecting the hammer to come down on us? Praise God. Are we expecting him to send sickness and disease and tragedy? Praise God. Amen. Um, hopefully you will understand after this study that that is not the case. Now, relating to those that um, actually are constantly doing evil, God is known, uh, according to the scriptures, by the type of judgments or decisions that he makes. And in Psalm 9, verses 15 and 16, it says, The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made. Who made that pit? They, they did. The heathen did. Praise God. Amen. And it goes on to say, In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. And then it goes on to say, The Lord is known by the judgment he executes. The wicked is snared in the work of whose hands? His own hands. Whose hands? 
His own hands. So God, basically the judgment that God renders is not to make the wicked get snared, um, but the, but to allow the wicked to, go, to suffer the consequences of their own sin. Praise God. Amen. In other words, whatever you do will boomerang back to you. Glory to God. Amen. So that which you sow, that shall you also reap. Basically, God's judgment is to allow the laws of sowing and reaping to take place. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. And then um, in the New Century Version, it says it this way. It says the Lord is made has made himself known by his fair decisions. Hallelujah. Amen. God is very fair in his decisions. And what is his decisions? To let the wicked get trapped by what they do. Praise God. Amen. 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 So God is not the one who traps the wicked. He's not the one who does anything destructive to the wicked. Wickedness brings its own punishment. Hallelujah. Amen. We've said it many times here before that sin brings its own punishment or sin contains within itself its own seeds of destruction. I also like the passion translation of this verse. It says, the Lord is famous for this. His justice will punish the wicked. While they are digging a pit for others, they are actually setting the terms for their own judgment. They will fall into their own pit. Praise God. Amen. So that this is one of the reasons why God tells you in um in Romans chapter 12 that that um if your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. It, it, if he's um, hungry, give him something to eat. He says, don't don't take vengeance for yourself. He says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And then it goes on to say, make room for the wrath of God. What it's saying is there is that you don't get vengeance, praise God, because it's going to come back to if they don't repent, they don't change. It's going to come back to them. Praise the Lord. Amen. But if you start taking revenge on people, guess what's going to happen? It's going to boomerang back on you, too. Hallelujah. When you forgive, you're forgiven. You don't forgive. You know, God tells, tells us these things to protect us. Praise God. Amen. But people, um, when they dig a pit, they get caught in their own pit sooner or later. Don't don't think that the wicked is going to prosper forever. Praise God. Amen. Amen. I, and then there's the contemporary English version that says, you, talking to God, you showed what you are like. And you made certain decisions that justice is done. But evil people are trapped by their own evil deeds. Praise God. Amen. So again, people suffer their own judgment. Amen. Amen. And um, Deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 3 and 4 it says, Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. For he is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment. Hallelujah. Amen. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 32 is describing here the, the character of God. And it says that his that part of his character is judgment or decision making. Fairness. Hallelujah. Amen. Justice. He's a God of, it, you know, that word justice. I mean, judgment can also mean justice, praise Jesus, Amen. or a fairness of justice. You know, um, as I wrote here, God's name is, a, is in reference to his reputation or character. His character includes being a God of judgment, a God who is just and fair, as we read further in the chapter. And we're going to learn in Deuteronomy 32 exactly how God executes his judgment. You're going to find out that it is right there in line with Psalm Chapter 9, um, God's word is consistent with itself. It interprets itself. Now, in verse 4, it says, he is like, uh, or excuse me, the Unlocked Dynamic um, Bible of verse 4 says, he is like a rock on top of which we are protected. Praise God. Amen. What does that mean? It means that when um, you fall under the negative judgment of God, that's one of the first things you lose is God's protection. So it says, so it says he is like a rock on top of which we are protected 
Everything that he does is com is perfect and completely just. Praise God. Amen. Fair. He's just. He always does what he says that he will do. He never does anything that is wrong. Ooh, that, that gives me confidence right there. Praise God. Amen. He always does what he says he's going to do. But here we see that God is a protector. And then when you jump down to verses 17 through 20 of Deuteronomy 32, talking about the Israelites, it says, They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very forward generation, children in whom is no faith. Praise God. Amen. So if you've been in, um, in these studies long enough, you, you, you kind of know what it means for God to hide his face praise the lord but why not explain it anyway especially for those who are um watching probably watching our videos for the first time but uh, the hiding of god's face means the loss of his protective presence remember we saw that god is a rock or a protector praise god Amen. but and when he hides his face he steps back to see what happens to those under his judgment amen, amen. in other words God doesn't um, take a lightning ball and strike people with it. He doesn't um, creatively send sickness and disease um, to, to, to hurt people. He doesn't send Ebola plagues, coronaviruses, and Spanish um, plagues and stuff like that. Praise God. Mm -hmm. God doesn't do any of that. He's not the one who personally inflicts the judgment. God, that's where... What it means for God to hide his face, it means he simply, if you don't want God to help you anymore, you don't want God to protect you anymore, then he steps away. Praise God. Amen. And so 18 through 20, and we're reading this from the Unlocked Dynamic Version, it says, They forgot the true God, the one who protects them, the one who created them and caused them to live. When Yahweh saw that they had abandoned him, he became angry. So he rejected the Israelite people who were like his sons and daughters. Notice the word rejected. He didn't do anything else to them. Praise God. Amen. In verse 20, it goes on to say, and he said, they are very wicked people, very unfaithful. So I will no longer help them. And then I will watch and see what happens to them. Praise God. Amen. So what you see there is that God's judgment is to Remove his protection, step back, and say, all right, y'all don't want me anymore? You want to worship other gods? You want to worship false gods? Then let us let me step back and see what happens to you. Praise God. Amen. Matter of fact, when, when, it, when, you really, when you finish reading that chapter, God says, call on your gods. When you're in trouble, call on them and see if they'll help you. Amen. Amen. I, I think he has a right to say that when you treat them so bad like that. You know, uh, such a loving God. Hallelujah. And then um, it goes on in, in verse 20 to say, How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them up? Praise God. Amen. Now, what does it mean for, the, for God as a rock? See, the rock, is, remember, we saw that God being a rock means that God is their protector. Praise God. Amen. As a matter of fact, I think that's verse 30. I got the, the verse wrong. But God is their rock or their protector. And to have sold them means that he gave them up. Um, the, the King James Version, I don't think it brings it out very well. So, of course, as you know, I always bring in other translations. And the contemporary English Version puts it this way. It says, how could one enemy soldier chase a thousand of Israel's troops? Or how could two of their of theirs pursue ten thousand of ours? It can only happen if the Lord stops protecting Israel and lets the enemy win. Isn't that much clearer? 
Amen. Yes, and the unlocked dynamic version says, you would have realized why a thousand of your soldiers would be defeated only by one of the enemy's soldiers. Why two of your enemies would chase away 10,000 Israelite soldiers. You would realize that this would happen only if God, the one who always defended you, had put you in the hands of your enemies that Yahweh had abandoned you. In other words, what God is telling you that them there is it does. And, and when you read the history of Israel, you find out this to be true. It doesn't no matter how much, how many people you have in your army. Praise God. Amen. If, if God is not the one protecting you, you in trouble. Two can beat you if you if you're not if you don't have God on your side. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. And, and if you only got a few, as, as Gideon found out and you got God on your side, you're going to win. Praise God. Amen. So um, this is why God wanted Israel to understand that the only way you win is if I'm protecting you. And if you if I'm not protecting you, then you are under the judgment of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, a um, couple other translations. The Wycliffe version says, how could just one of their enemies pursue a thousand Jews and two drive away ten thousand? Was it? Not because their God had forsaken them and had sold them out to their enemies. Yea, the Lord had given them up into the hands of their enemies. And the Bible in basic English says, if their rock had not let them go, if the Lord had not given them up. Praise God. Amen. Amen. And so um, Romans chapter 1 verses 23 to 28 in the Living Waters translation um, it's some. It basically sums up what we're trying to say in this portion of our study. It says, instead of admiring and honoring the true character of God, this is talking about the people who started falling into sexual sins, homosexuality, lesbianism, and stuff like that. It says, instead of admiring and honoring the true character of God, they turned their devotion towards things resembling man and animals, birds, and reptiles. So in his judgment, praise God. Notice it says in his judgment. Was it, what, what did God do in his judgment? God has allowed, say allowed. allowed. Hallelujah. So in his judgment, God has allowed them to be seduced by the filthy lust of their own hearts and the perversion of their physical bodies with one another. Praise God. Amen. So God didn't make them sin. He didn't make them um, commit sexual um, sin and then get all kinds of venereal diseases and, and sickness and mental illnesses and stuff like that. God simply said, well, if that's what you want to do, I'm no longer going to restrain you from it. Praise God. Amen. But this reflects the true character of God right there, that God is not one who does um, personal hurt to anybody. God is simply the one who says, all right, I'm going to let you have what you want. Praise God. Amen. And so now um, for the rest of the study, we want to look at the fact that God's judgment. I mean, we've already seen it, but we want to show you even more proof, more evidence that God's judgment is permissive and not causative. Glory to God. Because um, if you listen to the majority of preachers, the majority of teachers, everybody talks about if, if they believe in God's judgment. It always seems to be that God is the one bringing, personally bringing the hammer down on people and destroying their lives using his creative power. And we want to show you that's not true. And since because um, the negative side or the belief that God is the one who actually personally hurts people in his judgment is so prevailing in the church, I, ha I feel the obligation to present as much evidence as I can on the other side of this truth. Praise God. Or, or it's help you to understand an alternative, un give you an alternative understanding of this. Now, again, my my main man, Joe Blair, I don't know him. I, I just say he's my main man because I just like his, his book. But in his book, When Bad Things Happen, God Still Loves, he said, he wrote this. In some cases... Old Testament writers and prophets did not bother to distinguish between what God did as an action of love and what God allowed to happen as the result of human choosing and action. The Hebrew mind at times attributed everything to God 
without bothering to distinguish between permitted judgment and the active judgment of God. Hallelujah. Amen. And so um, we believe we do believe that scripture um, supports Brother Blair's point here. And Psalm 34, 21 in the New International Reader's Version, it says sinners will be killed by their own evil. The enemies of godly people will be judged. Praise God. Amen. Or as the New English Translation says, evil people self-destruct. Basically, it goes right back to um, Psalm chapter 9. Um, God allows you to dig your own pit and fall into it. Praise God. Sin is destructive in and of itself. Uh, um, in a couple of Sundays from now, we're probably going we're, we're to be teaching on the um, self-destructive power of sin. Because people keep sinning. They, they think there's just no repercussions for sin. You know... People say I'm in this age of grace, and so I can, you know, um, I can do whatever I, I want, and God will still love me. Oh, yeah, He'll still love you, but you're hurting yourself. Praise God. Amen. Amen. You're, you're destroying yourself, and so we want you to see that sin. It, it may be pleasurable, but it's self-destructive. Nobody tells you um, that 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 cocaine or that crack. It'll give you a nice high. It'll make you feel good. It'll make you feel like you're up in the air. But man, that stuff will destroy you in the long run. Praise the Lord. Amen. You ever been around a crack addict? I have. And that, and I can tell you that drug destroys you. Praise God. Um, sleeping around with, a, with different sex partners, eventually that's going to destroy you. Praise God. Amen. So you don't, you, you want to avoid being destroyed. That God does not tell us to, to stop sinning and live holy because he doesn't want us having any fun. He tells us that. And he's and he's not telling us that because he's he's um, angry and wants a, a reason to destroy us. God's telling us that because he doesn't want us to be hurt. Praise God. Amen. And that's and sin hurts us. Hallelujah. Now, judgment going back to what it means for God to judge in the and Ezekiel 1638. God telling his people Israel because they just you know, Israel just has a history of messing up, man. And God continued to beg and plead them and, and try to work with them, and they just won't do right. But in Ezekiel 13, 16, 38, in the Darby translation, he says, And I will judge thee with the judgments of a woman that commit adultery and shed blood. And how does God judge them? He says, I will give thee up to the blood of fury and jealousy. Praise God. Amen. Amen. So God judges not by personally bringing harm to people, but by giving people up to the sin that they want to commit. Second Chronicles 24, 24. It says, for the army of the Syrians came with a small company of men and the Lord delivered a very great host into their hand because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. That goes right back to Deuteronomy 32. Where God said that if, if ten thousand can, can if you got ten thousand men and only two people can beat you, that's because I've given you up. Praise God. Amen. So the Lord delivered them into the into the hands of their enemies. So they executed judgment against Joash. Praise God. Amen. 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 Uh, the New International Reader's version of that says the army of Aram had come with only a few men. But the Lord allowed them to win the battle over a much larger army. Judah had deserted the Lord, the God of their people. That's why the Lord punished Joash. Praise God. So the judgment of God was not to personally um, do anything to Israel, but to simply remove his hand of protection. The easy to read version of this says the Aramean army came with only a small group of men, but the Lord let them defeat the much larger army of Judah. This was a punishment for Joash because the people of Judah had left the Lord, the God their ancestors worshipped. Praise God. And then we go to Ezekiel chapter 11 verses 9 through 10. Make sure that one's up there. Praise God. It says, and I will deliver you out of the midst thereof and deliver you into the hands of strangers 
and will execute judgments among you. You shall fall by the sword. I will judge you in the border of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Praise God. Amen. So how does God judge these people? By simply allowing their enemies to defeat them. Praise God. Amen. In other words, God steps back, steps aside, and lets the enemy take, um, take over. Praise God. The enemy was already desiring to destroy Israel anyway. It was God that was holding the enemy back. And so when Israel decides that they want to keep sinning against God, God says, all right, I'm taking my hands off then. I've given you all chance after chance, and this is the way you want to treat me. So here, worship your own, worship these false gods, and let me see if they'll protect you. Praise God. Amen. So now... Going back to the to the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 23 through 28. Um, but let's just look at verses 27 and 28. Praise God. Um, it says, and likewise, men lost interest in a natural sexual union with women. I just don't. I can't see that. Praise. I don't know how people do that. Uh, I can't see myself with another man. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> I just can't see it. Uh, I. I, I've sinned a lot in my life, but that's just not one of the ones that ever tempted me. But anyway, um, and likewise, men lost interest in a natural sexual union with women in preference for an unnatural sexual union with other men. Men shamelessly perform sexual acts with other men and thus find themselves enslaved in consequences that naturally follow their perverted practices. Since they did not consider worth their while to acknowledge God in the way they live, God's judgment. Now look at what God's judgment was. God's judgment was to abandon them to the further consequences of their own degenerated minds and outrageous conduct. Praise God. Amen. So what was God's judgment? To abandon them. Praise the Lord. Amen. And so we conclude here. Um, basically in, in the conclusion that, you know, I, I, I write these things out, the, my thoughts, in, so I don't forget them or try to, or stumble over them when I'm trying to do it from memory. But basically God's judgment is to allow you to, 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 to do whatever you want and then suffer the consequences of it. Praise God. Amen. God will try to restrain you. He'll try to hold you back. But if you're going to keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep saying, God, leave me alone. I, I want to do what I want to do. God's going to finally have to say, OK, I'm you got the free will. Do it. Praise God. Amen. But see, God doesn't have to, he don't have to um, send some kind of miraculous judgment against you. God doesn't have to do that. There is enough evil in this world to destroy you when God simply leaves you alone. Praise God. So God does not have to act in a destructive manner. As I stated here, sin contains within itself its own seeds of destruction. God, What is God's judgment? It's simply to step out of the way and allow the natural consequences of sin to take effect. Praise God. Amen. That's what it means for God to judge in a nutshell. Praise God. I am, And this is... Um, I just tried to gather this so that we can um, ha only have one session on this. I didn't want to deal with this in a series. Amen. At least not tonight. Um, I, you know, and since people are been asking for this teaching, you know, we want to make we just want to try to make it short. Um, but at, but at the same time, we want to give you as much information and proof as possible to show you that. This is the method by which God judges. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. So hopefully um, those of you who are watching by video are being helped, blessed. And, you know, um, you can always email me or call me or um, put down your comments and your questions. And, um, well, make sure that you like and subscribe if you're watching this by, on YouTube. Praise God. And if you're not watching this on YouTube, then go to YouTube and like and subscribe to our page. 